So, brothers and sisters, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to uh, just start this first, this second talk by just saying, you know, I, I get very excited by these things, you know, and no doubt you'll have seen that and just thought to themselves, you know, goodness me, this one's uh, perhaps a bit overanimated. Uh, I, 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 I'm not, I hope I don't come across hugely dogmatic. I, I don't mean to. In the study of the scripture and seeing these things, I know I get massively excited and I think, wow, you know, these things are, are going to happen and, and that can come across. Um, but I recognise that we are looking at passages which are future and I, um, and I don't want you to kind of think, oh goodness me, that, that you know, young whippersnapper at the front was there kind of shoving forward his views. Um, I would love to discuss these things afterwards with you. And uh, you know, I, 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 the brethren who have spoken to me already this evening, I, I genuinely appreciate it hugely. You know, so please, please come along and uh, chat these things over and uh, together we can be excited by these events which we believe to happen. But to be just sort of clear on a recap of why we think Think that Elijah would go to Judah. He's promised that he would do in Malachi chapter 4. Now I'll happily chat to anybody afterwards to show why I don't think John the Baptist is simply um, all that Elijah was being promised in, in Malachi 4. He clearly wasn't. In fact, he denied the fact that he could be. And so there's no way that he was. So Elijah has to come. Scripture is true. You know, what has been promised will happen. What's more, we then realise that the Jews in Judah have faith. To me, to suggest that they just get faith from thin air is nonsense. You know, uh, did that sound dogmatic? He did, didn't it? Uh, uh, you know, they, they must have got their faith from the Word. Again, the Bible is clear that faith comes from the Word. And then we see passages about the fact that teaching would go on, the doctrine, the reign, you know, like Zechariah 10. So don't think that when we're kind of putting these passages together, it's unfair to suggest that Elijah would be sent to them to teach them, to prepare them for when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, and that's why he saves the remnant. So that then deals in its sense, in a, in a small way, in a quick way, with what has happened with the Jews who are living in the land, referred to as the Jews in Judah. But we also recognise that the Lord Jesus said that Elijah would come to restore all things. And there's that same slide that we looked at. And so we believe it's very probable that Elijah will be involved once again, now in the restoration of the wider nation. Uh, and again, I hope that as we go through the passages together, you won't again think, oh, how is he getting this? What, the reason that I have felt confident in this is there are so many echoes to the Elijah work that was in the 1 Kings passages, 1 Kings 17, 18 and 19. And so it seems so probable that he is there amongst this work of turning the nation. Uh, and there's another, one key, another key passage that we'll see regarding that as well. And it seems to me that wherever Elijah goes, his impact will be great. Uh, as the rabbis come to grasp from the law, that the promises that were made to the fathers were centred on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word will spread, no doubt, and those who are genuine will be converted. So scattered Jews from around the world will begin then returning to the land because of this work. And exodus will begin. Uh, and as those scattered Jews from around the world begin to return to the land, Many Gentiles will want to be associated with, with them, realising that there's life in the hope of Israel. Come to Romans 11. I want you to notice that this key chapter, all about the restoration of Israel, I'm sure that uh, if we had a poll just now and said, you know, tell us a chapter about the latter restoration of Israel, 90% of the people in this room would say Romans 11, straight away from the top of their minds. And who does this chapter start with? Isn't it interesting? It starts with thinking about Elijah in chapter 11 and there in verse 2. Uh, and actually what it's showing there at the beginning of chapter 11 is referring back to those 1 Kings passages to the time when he gave up thinking that he was the only one. And yet it seems to me that as we're going to see later how lovely it is that he is going to be involved in the restoration now of all Israel. But you see from verse 12, and this is the point we really came here for, that the Gentiles are going to benefit from the restoration of Israel. If the fall of the Jews be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? 
how much more their fullness. So as the Jews are coming in, now are being converted, coming into the new covenant, that is going to be of great benefit to the Gentiles. If the falling of them was good for the riches of the world, how much more when the Jews are coming into this? Now, while we're in this chapter, I want you to pick up that verse 8 is a citation from Isaiah 29. So, again, just take the time to kind of see that, uh, perhaps circle it in the margin, and then I'd like to go back to Isaiah 29, which we'll see is a chapter regarding the return of Israel, which, of course, is why it's being cited in Romans 11. So, back in Isaiah 29, the passage quoted is in verse 10. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and the rulers, the seers, hath he covered. Uh, and, of course, Israel right now is asleep. Again, Brother Peter referred to the fact that you know, they've come back in unbelief. But what we're going to learn is that despite the fact being asleep now and blind at the moment to the teaching of Scripture, something is going to change. Let's have a look. Verse 17. Is it not yet a very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest? And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Now, why is it that Lebanon might interest? Well, this is where Elijah's work began, isn't it? You think of 1 Kings 17. His work began up there in Lebanon when he went up to Zarephath. Also, I want you to notice that it's going to be turned into a fruitful field. Well, the Hebrew for fruitful field is Carmel. Okay, I haven't got it on the screen, sorry. But the Hebrew for fruitful field is Carmel. And isn't that interesting? That's 1 Kings 18, where they were with the prophets of Baal. And so it seems to me that here in verse 17 is a picture of Elijah's work in turning them from being blind and being deaf to the word, to now being able to hear the word of God, to now being able to see the word of God. And you see then the result of this in verse 22. Therefore thus saith the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall now, shall, sorry, shall not now be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale. But when he sees his children, the work of mine hands in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, and shall fear the God of Israel. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding, and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. So what we see there is the fathers turning to the children. You see that? Verse 23, when he, Abraham, and uh, his, the fathers, sees his children. The fathers are now looking at the children. Uh, and we see then the children, at the same time, have come to learn. They've come to learn doctrine, as it says at the end of verse 24. So what a lovely picture that is. But we're not mistaken to think that terrible events haven't also happened. I want you to just turn back to verse 6. It says there, Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder, with earthquake, with great noise, with whirlwind, a storm, and tempest, and the flame of devouring fire, and the multitude of all the nations that fight against, Ariel, against Jerusalem. Even all that fight against her, and her munition, and, and that distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. Now, very clearly there, God is, is showing that an earthquake, a wind and a fire, terrible judgments would come against Jerusalem. And we believe that to be speaking of Armageddon. Those terrible things had to happen, but Elijah's work is concerned in the voice that is preaching from the word to turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children. And so the events of Armageddon were terrible judgments, an earthquake, wind and fire language we could think of. But as the Lord Jesus with many saints are working to establish Jerusalem and the surrounding area as the capital city of God's kingdom, Elijah and a company of messengers are now going out to turn scattered Israel. And I want you to come back to Zechariah 10 now. We, we were at Zechariah 10 earlier. And I want us to go back because it seems that this chapter is very good at being able to help us see the distinction between the Jews in the land and the Jews who are scattered. And that 
again, is helping us to see why we believe that there's likely to be sort of two parts to Elijah's work. So here in Zechariah 10, and uh, we remember we've been here already in verses 1 to 3. In fact, we went right down to verse uh, 5. We went down to regarding Judah turning and becoming God's goodly horse in the battle. But if we now go in at verse 6, it says, I will strengthen the house of Judah, so we know that, and I will save the house of Joseph. And we believe the house of Joseph is a reference to the Jews who are scattered around the world. And I will bring them again to this place. Now, it's in, you realise that there's clearly a distinction, isn't there? Because we've got the Jews who are already in the land, who have become God's goodly horse in the battle, in verse 3. But now we're being told that there's other Jews who God is now going to bring again to this place. Because he's also, verse 6 goes on to say, going to have mercy upon them. And they shall be as though I had not cast them off. For I am the Lord their God, and will hear them. And they of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice rejoices through wine. Yea, their children shall see it and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. I will hiss for them and gather them, for I have redeemed them and they shall increase as they have increased. And I will sow them among the people and they shall remember me in far countries and they shall live with their children and turn again. I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria and I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon and place shall not be found for them. And so you see that the Jews that are scattered now are being brought in. The remnant Judah is now converted. The Lord Jesus Christ has saved them from the northern invader and so they're now working with the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints to defend the land. Uh, and perhaps it is that they too could be involved in the preaching work to scattered Israel. As God, as he says in uh, verse uh, 8, is going to be hissing for them. And the idea of hissing is, uh, sounds kind of, again, straight, strange to us, but it's simply the idea of a shepherd whistling for his sheep. It's a lovely idea. Uh, and as sheep would be willing to follow their shepherd, so too scattered Israel would be willing at that time. In fact, I think this is a lovely cross-reference. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. They're willing now to come to the Lord God, to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, come into the land. The phrase in verse 9, I will sow them among the people, is again a lovely picture of this work of restoration. And our margins will have a cross-reference there, or it's like mine, to Hosea 2. I'd like to go back to Hosea 2 now. I've got to tell you, when I was doing this study and going through Hosea 2 and 3, um, I was practically leaping up out of my chair every five minutes and having a dance around the living room because there were so many things coming out of this chapter that was exciting me regarding the work of Elijah. And I hope that I'm going to be able to kind of show that to you and, uh, and convince you as it convinced me that there surely is this work to come. So we want to go in at verse 12. It says, I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she has said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me. And I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. Now, immediately I'm just going to stop, because it struck me as being interesting that the one person that we know in Scripture who wanted the rewards of vineyard was Ahab, the very king that Elijah had to battle with. And it was given to him by his lover Jezebel. Isn't that interesting? So verse 12 where it says, I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, wherefore she has said, these are my rewards that my lovers have given me. Immediately we see some echoes there to Elijah. Carrying on though, we're going to see Israel being turned in its beautiful description here now. I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and forgot me, saith the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give unto her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. It shall come to and sorry, and shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and thou shalt call me no more Baali. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. 
And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of the heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me for ever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. And thou shalt know the Lord. And in that day, and it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil. And they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that have not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which are not my people, Thou art my people. And they shall say, Thou art my God. And we're going to come back to, to explain so many of the verses here. But, but this whole thing is summed up now in the final verse of chapter 3, where it said, Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. And again, we can just note the connections immediately from that verse, verse 5 there, um, to Elijah verses, that they'll return is the same word that they will turn. And where it says in Malachi 3, that speaking of the Lord whom you seek, they're regarding Elijah again. Here it is, that they're going to seek the Lord their God. And David their king is a sure reference, isn't it, to the Lord Jesus Christ now on the throne of David. So, we, so in a sense, that verse 5 summarises what we're looking at here. That they are going to come into the land and they're going to seek the Lord their God and, and David, the Lord Jesus Christ, their king. Uh, and uh, it's going to be clearly, as it says in the end of that verse, in the latter days. Now, let's go back to chapter 2 and start bringing out some of the ideas that we're able to see. We, we've seen the idea of God sowing from Zechariah 10, and that's the, name, the meaning of the name Jezreel. And so when we saw there, and uh, it came through very clearly, didn't it, at the end of verse 22, the idea of Jezreel. Um, Jezreel was the place that Elijah gave up, wasn't it, at the end of 1 Kings 18. But now, now that's being turned by God into something incredible, as people now come into the new covenant. And we know that this is talking about the new covenant, because it's one that will last forever, and it's based on faith. So, so when it says in verse 20, I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, no, it's got to be the new covenant. They're now coming in faith. Um, in fact, you could uh, take out the words in verse 19, just after it says it's going to be forever, uh, the righteousness and judgment there, and I've given you a cross-reference back to Genesis 18 and verse 19, which is speaking about the children of Abraham, uh, and it's speaking about the, the true seed of Abraham, those who have faith. We're also able to, to pick out from this that the, the valley of Achor is turned into a door of hope. I want to just look at the margin for Achor in verse 15. My margin says troubling. That's what it means, troubling. Now, again, it seems interesting to me that um, Elijah had to say to Ahab, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that you've forsaken the commandment of the Lord and has followed Baalim. Uh, so God is turning the, the problems of those times now into a hope. And what's also interesting is that Elijah was picking up the fact that they were following Balaam. Look again at verse 13. I will visit upon her the days of Balaam. You know, this is what's going on. He's saying, I'm going to deal with those old times, and now we're going to turn it into something positive. The Israel is now going to turn and, and come into the new covenant. Your margin for speak comfortably at the end of verse 14, so it says that God will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her, will say that the Hebrew there is to the heart. And um, I think, again, that that's lovely because we're able to remember that Elijah's work is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. This is speaking of his work, we believe, that God would bring them in and speak comfortably, speak to their hearts. We also see from verse 15 that it was as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. In other words, it's an exodus. 
And again, we're not surprised by the Exodus language because we remember that Elijah was made to stand in the shoes of Moses on Horeb. And even more significantly, he appeared with Moses next to the Lord Jesus Christ to this transfiguration. And as we mentioned earlier, they spoke about the Exodus. So Elijah is bringing about an Exodus here uh, of people coming back to the land. That's why he was there. Moses brought an exodus. Elijah is going to bring an exodus of people that have come in to the land, Jews. We realise as well that the Gentiles are involved here. And uh, I I thought this was a lovely idea. Uh, The list of beasts and bugs in verse 18 in that day I will make a covenant for them, for, for Israel, with the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, the creeping things of the ground. Those things that are listed are the very things which are listed in Acts 10 when Peter saw the vision. And Peter was being shown then by God that he had to be prepared to go to preach to the Gentiles. And so what I think is lovely is we remember from Romans 11 that the fullness of Israel will be great help to the Gentiles. So so here it is that the Gentiles are being able to share in this. That They're able to, because the Jews are coming into the land, Gentiles are also involved in that. So no wonder it says in Zechariah 8, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that's a Jew, saying, we'll go with you. For we have heard that God is with you. Uh, and Isaiah 56 and verses 6 and 7 says exactly the same thing, that the Gentiles will see that th- there's hope with the Jews. The Jews are going back to the land, they recognise that the kingdom is being established, and any of them that got any sense are saying, well, we, we, can we come with you? We recognise that we can be saved. There's hope in the hope of Israel. And so God will be pleading with them through the work of the prophet Elijah. Those who respond will join this exodus heading to the promised land where they'll be brought into the new covenant. And you remember how the apostle in 1 Corinthians 10 describes the national baptism of Israel into Moses at that time. And it could be that that something similar takes place during this exodus. Again, come to Zechariah 10. We keep coming back here, don't we, to Zechariah 10. We should have uh, got a full-time marker in here. We, um, we left off um, sort of explaining in verse 9, where we're told that they will turn again. But let's just recap verse 10 again to the end of the chapter. I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria. And I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon and place shall not be found for them. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and shall smite the waves in the sea. And all the deeps of the Nile shall dry up. Sorry, the river it says there, but the RV says the Nile. And the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepters of Egypt shall depart away. And I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord. So here we recognise that they're brought initially, aren't they, having come into the land of Egypt, so they have to cross the Nile or cross the Euphrates um, from up in Assyria, and they come into Gilead and Lebanon. Now, we've already pointed out in Isaiah 29 that Lebanon was where Elijah began his work, and we're going to see in a moment why Gilead is also significant. So just point, just note that point that Gilead is there. They're going to be brought into Gilead and Lebanon. We've seen the significance of Lebanon. We want to see the significance of Gilead as well. But we can also see from here that the initial territory of the kingdom is now established. This was the land that was promised to Abraham in Genesis 15. The Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now eventually in Romans 4 and verse 13, we realise that Abraham was in actual fact in promised the entire world. The whole world is going to be, in the end, full of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. We believe that of course but initially the kingdom when it is first established will go it seems within this uh, the the boundaries of the river Nile down there to the river Euphrates this land that was promised and so that is why at this point they're getting to a safe haven as they're coming from in Zechariah 10 They're, they're coming from the land of Egypt from the south or from Assyria in the north. This is the initial kingdom territory. And so we've got this picture of them coming by faith, having to cross these rivers almost as a national baptism as they come into the new covenant. 
And as in the first um, exodus, they'll be given safe passage. Here in Isaiah 11 it speaks of it. The Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river, and, make it, and shall smite it in uh, the seven streams, and make men go over dry shod. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel, as in the day when he came up out of the land of Egypt. So there's a latter-day passage, and you can see the echoes again with the fact that it's like the initial exodus, like when they came up out of the land of Egypt. But again you see that it's from the Egyptian sea, down the Nile, up to Assyria, to the Euphrates, that this land is stretching. Uh, and again, we recognise there's going to be a highway there, as I've, I've kind of highlighted there, but also you remember from Isaiah 35, that a highway will be there. That, so people have got safe passage, once they get into the kingdom territories, they're now safe. And a way shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. And of course you know Isaiah 35 so well, you'll know what a beautiful passage it is about the kingdom, and about how people at that point, you know, there would be no lion there, there would be nothing, once they get there, they're safe, as they're able to now come into the land. Those brought into the new covenant will be given places to live in the land, uh, as the land will be split into the twelve tribe territories. And again, we don't have time to go into this, but Ezekiel speaks of the fact that the land will be split into those territories. Ezekiel 48 and verses 1 to 8 details that for us. And we know also that the twelve apostles will be ruling over them, that the Lord Jesus Christ promised that they would be doing that. Now, I'd like us to go to Ezekiel 20 though now. Because we'll realise from here that amongst the Jews who begin this exodus and start coming towards the land won't necessarily be ones who are coming in faith. Many will be in faith, I'm sure. But there will also be amongst them some who are coming perhaps to try and cause trouble at the kingdom. Rebels they're described as here in Ezekiel 20. So here in Ezekiel, we're going to go in um, at verse 33. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you in out of the countries wherein you were scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. And interesting, we already saw the idea from Hosea too, didn't we? The, the bringing you into the wilderness. And there will I plead with you face to face, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And again you see the echoes back to the fact that it's like the initial exodus. And I will cause you to pass under the rod. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge out from among you the rebels, and them that transgress against me. And I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. And so as they're brought in, out into the wilderness, and those who aren't sincere will be purged out. At the end of our talk, where we were, uh, our first talk, we're in Isaiah 27, looking at Judah's conversion, we were up to verse 10, but, but it then went on to say in verse 12, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. Uh, and I wonder there if this idea of God beating off there, in other words, getting rid of the rebels, is a cross reference that we could have there again verse 38 of Ezekiel 20. I want you to also notice here that uh, your margin against pass under the rod in verse 37. I'm going to cause you to pass under the rod. You have a cross-reference to Leviticus 27, which I put on the screen. Um, and this is uh, you know, a connection that, again, we in no way is suggesting dogmatically, but we just wonder. This is the only other time that this uh, phrase comes in Scripture. If we, we're learning that of those, there's so many Jews that are, are from around the world, perhaps only a tenth of them will actually come in to the new covenant. Or, another suggestion I kind of thought possibly around that, could be that... Um, of those 
that are coming in, a tenth of them will be taken to be used as priests in the land. Um, so again, you can see that I'm not altogether 100% sure. I'm kind of giving you a couple of suggestions of what perhaps that reference could be referring to, of them being brought under the rod. Certainly those who do now trust wholly on the Lord their God are, are going to be able to come into the kingdom land. And if we read from verse 39, you'll see again that the idols have got to go, which we've seen from Isaiah 27, we've seen from Zechariah 10. As for you, it says, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, go ye, serve ye everyone his idols, and hereafter also, if ye will not hearken unto me. But pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. So saying, if that's what you want, go. Get out. you rebels, we don't want you. But if you hearken unto me, you can come in. For in my holy mountain, in the mountain of the height of Israel, saith the Lord God, there shall all the house of Israel, all of them, so now all of them, the Jews that are in the land to begin with, and now the ones who have been brought from uh, being scattered around the world, they're all going to come in and serve me. Therefore will I accept them, and there will I require your offerings and the first fruits of your oblations with all your holy things. I will accept you with your sweet savour when I bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries wherein you have been scattered. And I will be sanctified in you before the heathen. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for the which I lifted up mine hand to give it to your fathers. And there shall ye remember your ways and all your doings wherein... Uh, Ye have been defiled, and ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sights for all your evils that ye have committed. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, when I have wrought with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings, O ye house of Israel, saith the Lord God. And it's sorry that I kind of keep reading, you know, you just keep going, because it's just so amazing what's being shown to them. The, the idea there of that they'll loathe themselves is because they come to realise the problem of sin. Um, we're just going to very quickly put a cross-reference to that. Uh, Ezekiel 36. Um, also uses that phrase. It's only used, uh, I think, um, I think I'm right by saying it's only used seven times in the Bible that word loather, and, and four of those are in Ezekiel. But this is speaking of exactly the same thing in Ezekiel uh, 36, verse 24. I will take you from among the heathen, gather you out of all countries, will bring you into your own land. Uh, they're going to be turned, their heart's going to be turned, verse 26. And we also then learn in verse 31, Then shall you remember your, your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and you shall loathe yourselves. There's that same phrase that, 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 that they come to kind of recognise how awful sin is. Uh, and I think that's exactly what that's saying there, that they realise the problem of sin in their lives. Uh, and that is where Israel at the moment are miles away from. You know, they're stubborn, trying to establish their own righteousness. But they're going to come to a point through the teaching of Scripture that they do realise, they'll loathe themselves, uh, they realise the problem of sin. And in a sense, that's where all of us have to get to, isn't it? A wretched man that I am. Once Israel acknowledged sin, God can save. Who can deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so Israel, like Judah, will, will come face to face with the Lord Jesus, see him that they pierced and mourn, loathe themselves. Yet because of their repentance now, sin can be dealt with because they have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, a faith that's come from instruction from the word. And we're confident that Elijah is the one who will be responsible for this particular work. Because God said, the Lord Jesus Christ said, sorry, Elijah truly shall come and restore all things. Through his teaching to build their faith and through the grace of God, they'll join their natural brethren, Judah, to make up the mortal population of the kingdom. Within the boundaries of those great rivers to the north and to the south of Israel. I'm going to try and finish in five minutes, but I want to show you one more point that I think is a lovely one. I'd like to go to Jeremiah 30. Here, here the prophet Jeremiah sees a picture of the return of Israel. And he sees it in a dream. Uh, and we know it's a dream because in chapter 31 and verse 26 he wakes up. So what he's been seeing in the, the preceding parts, in chapter 30 and 31, has been a dream. We also know that this dream is far-reaching, because verse 31 of chapter 31 
explicitly talks about Israel coming into the new covenant. And clearly that has not yet happened. And what Jeremiah sees in this dream is actually a picture of Jacob, of Jacob returning from Haran. And when Jacob did return from Haran, he had to cross the Euphrates. Uh, in fact, um, yeah, we're able to start trying to put some of these things together. So I want to uh, just see how much you're seeing Jacob in this. Come to chapter 13, verse 7. Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 10. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob. Carries on in verse 10 to mention Jacob again and their return at the end of verse 10. Verse 18. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places. Uh, and carrying on then in chapter 31 and verse 7. Thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob. Verse 11, for the Lord hath redeemed Jacob. So he's seeing Jacob returning from Haran, and yet he's seeing it actually as a prophecy of when Israel would eventually return into the land. And when Jacob first came, he had to cross through Euphrates, and he had to come into Gilead. And we want to think to ourselves, well, why then Gilead? Well, that's a pattern for the future return. Zechariah said, didn't he? And I said at the time in Zechariah 10, log this. We saw they come to Lebanon, they also come to Gilead. Why Gilead? Well, Gilead, I love this, is where Elijah's from. Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead. And so Jacob, when he returned, came into Gilead. And the promise is that when Israel eventually returns, Zechariah 10, that they will come into Gilead, where Elijah was from. Gilead means witness. And it's lovely to think that Elijah's work is actually all about the witness of the Jews. The Gentiles, as we try to show, will see that if God can have mercy on them, then surely they too can be saved. How much more the fullness of Israel coming in. And so, now in Jeremiah, though, we see in a beautiful way how that Jeremiah sees Jacob's return as prophetic of the return when scattered Israel returned to the land. So, chapter, uh, we've gone through the kind of connections to Jacob, but having a look then at uh, verse 15 of uh, Jeremiah 31 now, it says, Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. And, and Jeremiah sees there how distraught Rachel would be at the scattering of her children. But now is the ultimate regathering. So the prophet goes on now to say, Therefore thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thy latter end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. I will sh I sh I've surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised, as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. And surely, after that I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnest remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. There are so many echoes to various places that we've uh, uh, been. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not, not going to try and go through them all. But I do want to bring this out because I tell you what, this is a stunner. This is so lovely. The, the word um, there, well let's have a look at verse 19 first of all. As soon as he's instructed, he says, I smote upon my thigh. Why is it that Israel, as they're coming now into the new covenant, having been instructed, having repented, goes to touch the thigh? Why would that be? Well, of course, it's because Jacob 
had his thigh put out of joint, didn't he? Why? To remind him to trust in God and not self. And now, as they are coming into the new covenant, trusting fully in God now, trusting fully in, not in themselves, they loathe themselves, they go to touch the thigh, recognising the lesson that they've now learnt, this need to trust in God. And as they come into this new covenant, the, the thigh goes there because I think the Lord Jesus Christ has healed it. Because, and the reason I say that is this. The description that he gives himself of, of, as a bullock in verse 18. The RV says calf. In fact, all the other times it is translated calf. Okay? And it's apt because that is the word that's used in Malachi 4. And to you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ, arise with healing in his wings. He can heal any broken thigh. <coughs> And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. What a beautiful picture we're seeing there of Israel now growing up in the safety of the kingdom. Being able to now go up, grow up as calves of the stall, the stall of the kingdom age. May it be, brethren and sisters, that these exciting things can spur us on. The hope of Israel is our hope. May we be amongst those whose faith comes from the word of his grace. He's able to build us up and to give us an inheritance among all those who are sanctified.